Before I get going, let me just uh, uh, sort of give an apology here. I'm a little bit discombobulated. This is weird. I mean, if you guys, this is your first year at Mises U, you wouldn't know this, but this, we're, we're, the schedule is totally different. I mean, you have no idea of the amount of new services we're offering for you this year. It's really amazing. Uh, and one of the things that we change up is normally we do these, the sessions where everybody's in the same thing early on in the week, you know, for the Monday and Tuesday. And then from Wednesday on, we just break up and you have like three possibly uh, sessions going on simultaneously. And so in the early, you know, week, early sessions of the week, people are supposed to dress up and have a coat and tie because that's being broadcast to everybody and donors might be tuning in, whatever. But then later on, when we're just off in little classrooms, you know, it gets more casual normally during the week. And so for me to be here on Thursday wearing the suit, I'm just, I'm out of place. I mean, normally it means you by Thursday, you're lucky if I'm still in a Speedo, okay? So <laughs> this is very strange. So I am in a Speedo, but just there's a student. <laughs> Okay, so obviously what I'm talking about, market for security. Uh, w before I, I'm going to get into that stuff, but I just, I want to make the, the statement, because a lot of people know that I personally am a pacifist, and, I, and for various, you know, moral reasons, but also just strategically, I do think that if you, know, you want to change the world and you, you, you think that there's these powerful forces arrayed against you, I don't think that it's smart like to say, oh, let's take on the federal government with, with guns. I, just, I think that they're going to, you know, they, they have the comparative advantage. I think they're better at using violence than we would be. And so uh, I, I, so for various like I said, moral and strategic reasons, I do think that people really should consider the efficacy of violence. And is that really the way you want to go? Couldn't you achieve more even against governments and, and trying to effect political change using civil disobedience and things like that with some of these uh, people from history that obviously were very influential and I think it, you, you'd be hard pressed to say, oh, if only they had been willing to, you know, gouge people in the eye or, or stab someone, they would have gotten so much more accomplished with their lives, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't say that about these people. So, uh, but now having said that, so then people say, well, how can you be a pacifist and then do all your stuff writing about private security and talking about the market for surface to air missiles and all that kind of, because don't worry, we're going to get into the fun stuff about blowing stuff up in a minute. But, so people say, how can you talk about that? Aren't you being a hypocrite? And I, um, just so you know, for those of you considering going into Austrian economics and libertarianism as a career, or I guess it's a vocation, Joe, Joe would want me to say, you, people, every other day you're going to get someone calling you a hypocrite. I mean, that's just part of, it goes with the job description. For some reason, everything you say, you're a, a hypocrite based on your, your views over here. So here, that's what people say, and that doesn't even make any sense to me that, no, as an economist, I can talk about market forces and say if we did have a free market in police services, judicial services, military defense, then this is the way things would unfold and it would be a lot more efficient than giving a government monopoly in those areas. Just like I can talk about the case for legalizing drugs as an economist, and then if someone found out that I don't do heroin, they say, oh, you're such a hypocrite, Bob. <laughs> right? So it gets, you really get the analogy. I don't need to beat that to death. Okay. So what's what's Interesting, I think, is that actually the case for private defense is a piece of cake. That's really not what trips people up. Really, what, when people give you all these zingers about, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? You know, what if there's 18 midgets who are armed with broadswords and they jump off of a plane? And <laughs> the, um, what, what happens is a lot of the times it boils down to really what the issue is, is they can't get how private law could work. And that's really what the stumbling block is. And that admittedly is a much more difficult problem. But I think once you see how that system could work, just in terms of having society or the consensus emerging within a group of people to say who is the aggressor here, who's the lawbreaker, or what is the law, and how do we determine who's law-abiding and who's a criminal, that's really the hard part, to say how could you do that without some monopoly agency that arrogates it to itself the right to make such pronouncements, and then the rest of us just have to fall in the line. If you don't have a single group vested with that authority to do that, it's, it's a lot more difficult to understand, you know, to, to just picture how could that work? Because everyone just kind of automatically assumes you need to have such a single group with the ability to do that in order to promulgate laws. So, I, like I say, I think a lot of these issues that trip people up in terms of private defense or just private police forces and so on, it's really an issue of private law. So I would say, work out, keep them separate. They're, they're different problems. There was one issue of how do we determine what property rights are? How do we determine who's a criminal, who's not? How do we determine what the lawful use of uh, self-defense is and things like that? 
And then once you know that, then it's just a matter of people contracting that out. You know, if you have the legal right to go use force to get your television set back because you think someone stole it from you, well, then it's to say, well, I'm actually a 98-pound weakling. I'm going to go hire someone else to do it. That's not really an issue. And you can totally see how, oh, the market would be more efficient there if there was competing agencies hiring out burly guys to go get your television set as opposed to that you have to go to the monopoly government that does that for you, right? So the issue is the, the, the definition of legal rights and so forth and what your redress is in case you think someone's violated your rights. That's the hard part. You get that solved and then just uh, enforcing those rules by having competing agencies trying to get your uh, patronage, that's, that's nothing. So let me just spend a few minutes then talking about this issue, what, how would private law work well, I think, the, again, the, the conceptual thing is to separate out the enforcement of it from the decision-making, the, the rendering of decisions. And so there, the, there's a clue. When you say, what does a judge do? A judge gives his or her opinion on something. And, I, and, it, and that's, that's now you know, how you, you see your reports about the Supreme Court. And, oh, and he wrote the you know, majority opinion, and he wrote the dissenting opinion. And we use that term opinion to be associated with, with judges and what they do, but I don't I think we just take it for granted and say, oh, yeah, that's the judge's opinion. But I take that word literally. I really think that you should consider it as a literal thing, that what the judge is saying is, in my opinion, looking at my knowledge of precedent, looking at my knowledge of the facts of this case and my intuitive sense of justice or whatever, I think the correct ruling in this case would be such and such. That's my opinion. And that's really all that a private judicial system is doing, is it's people who are experts in various types of cases when disputes arise between people and they can't solve it on their own, they take that dispute to a third party. And how do they pick that person? In a, in a free society, it's not because a bunch of guys with guns say, oh, if anyone has a, a dispute in this area, then you get assigned this person, and this person's going to tell you who's right and who's wrong. Obviously, that's not the way it works in a free society. In a free society, people can't decide, you know, there's an argument. They then say, well, we can't work this out. Let's take it to somebody. And the person they're going to take it to is going to have a reputation for fairness and objectivity and knowing the law in that particular area. Right? So that's, that's, I think, the way 99% of judicial issues would be resolved in a free society is that people would take it voluntarily. Both sides would agree beforehand to go to this particular person that they might call a judge. Nowadays, in our society, we would think, oh, that's arbitration. And that's exactly what happens on our arbitration. Both people, you know, if someone's going through a divorce or some business and an employee, the, you know, the business fires the employee and the employee says, no, that wasn't right. You owe me wages that you didn't pay me. And the business says, no, we don't. And they can't work it out. They don't want to take it to a government court because it'll just take forever. And so they can both agree beforehand, all right, let's go to some arbitrator and just deal with this because we, we need to move on. You know, this is costly for both of us to, not, to have this up in the air. We have to resolve this dispute. We're not going to settle it by arm wrestling, we're not going to settle it, you know, by having a duel, because that's crazy. We're going to, you know, it's bad for business, and also you might get shot. So what we're going to do instead is uh, take it to an arbitrator. And it's not that, oh, well, then we're, we're in trouble. Everyone knows that this, the arbitrator is always rule in favor of the business. Well, no, that's not true, because if it were true, then the employees would never agree to that, right? So there is a market for an actually objectively fair uh, arbitration process. So let me just give you some quick analogies, because a lot of people think that, no, no, that's impossible. What you're describing can't exist. But we see that sort of thing all the time in different areas. So like if, it's, if you're talking about science, scientific journals, for example, I mean, there, how is it that, that good science is promulgated? And of course, if there's government funding and things, that messes it up. But in the original spirit, and how would it be in a free society, there wouldn't have to be just some group of people called the physicists, and then they get to determine who the other physicists are using force, and they have a monopoly. That's not the way it would work. Someone would come along and try to do, you know, publish a paper and submit it for peer review and so on, and the other physicists in the field would decide whether they thought it was good or not. And it's, it's hard to actually put your finger on who is determining who the right physicists are, who the best physicists are. You'd say, well, the, the people in the field are, but how do they get to be in the field? Well, because the other physicists let them in. So it's an odd process, but it's I think we can all agree, especially in a free society, it's not that physics would be arbitrary. It's not that the people who would be getting accolades and would be teaching at the top schools would be a bunch of fools and wouldn't know anything about the laws of nature better than the average Joe. No, those people would be experts in that area, and it wouldn't be arbitrary, and yet there would be no monopoly the way the government right now has a monopoly on 
judicial rulings. I'll just give you one more example, in a, especially in a free society, but even right now, who determines what words mean? Who defines words? And people might say, you know, a very superficial answer would be to say, oh, the people, the, the publishers of dictionaries, they define what words are. But no, they don't. If Webster's came out with a new edition and said that the word up, U-P, means moving towards the floor, we wouldn't just all walk around saying, oh, I guess I was mistaken. No, we would say, <laughs> we would say that's, they, they put the wrong definition and what are they doing? And if they did that a lot and we kept finding those mistakes, people would stop buying from Webster's and they'd go out of business, right? So what the publishers of dictionaries do is codify the definitions that prevail in the community, right? So they don't get to invent what the words mean, they just codify it. And then you could say, well, wait a minute, but then what's, what's the role of, of having a dictionary? What's the point of having a dictionary in the first place if they're just writing down what we already know? And again, you, you see like these superficial things that might be objections to private law, but you can see in the case of dictionaries that that's silly. No, dictionaries serve a very useful function because a lot of us don't know exactly what words mean or we think we know what they mean and we use it in a certain way and then you look it up and say, oh my gosh, I've been using this word wrong for 20 years, right? That's, that's happened to me before, you know, you use a certain word in a way and it, like, because you use it in one sense where it works, but then you try to apply it somewhere else and you realize that actually it, it, didn't, it didn't carry over because you'll look up the actual definition. So the, the point is, we collectively as English speakers know what those words mean, the community somehow knows, but yet not everyone is an expert on it. There are some people that that's what they do. They specialize in knowing the definitions of English words and they are the ones who write dictionaries. Or it's even more compelling in the case of grammar books or style books for writers. And you can look up and say, oh yeah, I shouldn't say firstly, I should say first when I start the sentence or whatever. So there, the point is there are rules of grammar. They're not, they're not completely arbitrary. It's not that you can just say whatever you want because, hey, there's no such thing as real language or there's no rules of language. No, there are rules, but there's also a sense in, in which we decide what they are. The, the, the English we speak now is different from the time when Shakespeare wrote. So the definitions of words and the grammar has evolved over time. So there is a sense in which we decide what the words are and what the rules are, but in other sense, anyone who tries to deviate from that is, is an oddball and is, is violating the rules of grammar. Okay, so... I think that's a good analogy in some respects for how private law works in general, that there would be people codifying certain principles, right? So there would be a role for people writing like theoretical books on this is the way the law ought to look in a just society. So, you know, Rothbard could have a natural law approach. Utilitarians might put their views out. Other people could put different things. And then the judges would make, would render opinions, would give opinions when cases are brought before them, perhaps drawing on those various strands that they think are relevant. And then the market would be, the market would determine which judges got more cases brought to them. And they also would probably rely a lot on, on precedent and case law because clients would want to have some inkling before they went into the case of how is this guy going to rule, right? That if, if, if that company's having the dispute with the employee, and saying, we think we paid you what we owe you, and, they, and the employee says, no, because you said you were going to give me bonus, and you didn't, da da da, da. They wouldn't want to, if they went to the, an arbitrator, and then he, they got in there, and he said, okay, the way we're going to solve this is to see who can chug this beer faster. Go. Right? <laughs> they would be stunned, and they said, that's not the way you ruled on previous case. We thought you were going to rule on this the way, you know. So the, so the point is, you would want predictability going into it, so it would be in the judge's interest to, do, to have standards to say things like these are the rules of evidence. You, know, you can't use hearsay, or maybe you can use hearsay with these exceptions. So a lot of the stuff that we now, that if you go into law, the, the things that seem natural and just to us, there would still be a role for that. It's just the way it would manifest itself is the judge would have to provide a service to attract people so that both sides would be willing to submit to the judge uh, beforehand, going into it. Okay, so then, of course, the question is, all right, that's fine for, like, civil disagreements and so but what about actual crimes? How, how would that work? And so here I'll, I'll start bringing in now the, the issue of uh, actual enforcement of the law too. So somebody, I, I come, I'm driving home, I see some guy breaking into my house and he runs out with a TV and I get it, so I, you know, he, he gets away before I can stop him. And I, I see him running out and I'm pretty sure it's the guy from down the street. I can't stand that guy and I just know he's a criminal, right? So I'm pretty sure he's the guy that took my TV and so I go down to his house the next day and I accuse him of it. I say, give me my TV back. I can look in there and see it. It's a TV that looks just like mine. And he says, you're nuts. That's, I've had this for three months, whatever. So we can't resolve it. 
Now, I could, let's say I'm absolutely certain that that's my TV. You might say, especially from a Rothbardian point of view, you might say that I'm perfectly morally justified in just marching in and taking that TV. And if this guy is, is a tough guy or like he's, you know, he's got a pit bull or something, you might even go further and say, I'm justified in calling up a bunch of buddies to come shoot the dog and take the television set, you know, <laughs> bind the guy or whatever, not kill him, but you know, do what I need to do to get my TV. You might even go that far and say, well, you know, it's his fault. He aggressed against me. I can do, you know, do the, the least amount of damage to him to get my TV back for sure. And that's his own fault if he's putting obstacles in my way. So, but, so my point is whether, whatever your views on that issue are, that's irrelevant because the community is not going to like me doing that. They're not going to like people just unilaterally saying, this guy's a criminal. He took my TV. I'm dead certain. And so I'm going to get a bunch of my buddies and break down his door and shoot his dog and, and take the television set. Right? That's just not, that's not a neighborly thing to do. My employer's not going to like that. They're going to say, yeah, we heard that you're breaking down. What are you doing? You know? So you, you get the point. That it's just not smart to do that. So rather than do that, I'm going to want to have a professional agency come to people that are trained. They might you know, have guys that are... Uh, burly guys with uh, bulletproof stuff on and, you know, fl flak jackets and things, and, like, maybe the, the plastic stuff that the police use, with the riots use, you know, so that they can be... And that they would have non-lethal means, like they would have nets and foam guns and stuff like that, or they wouldn't come in with guns blazing to get a TV because that, that would be reckless. There would be no reason to escalate it to that level. Okay, so that's... So you would do that, but then even there, the... Um, the, the private agent, the, the enforcement agencies, again, they wouldn't just take my word for it. They couldn't just say, yep, whoever comes in here and is willing to plunk down the money, we'll go and get TVs for you and break down doors and give them to you, right? That'd be crazy because they, how would they know whether that really is the TV or, or the right person's TV? So those agencies would say, before we act on your behalf, you have to bring us an opinion from a reputable judge saying, you know, ruling in your favor. So what I have to do in this case I, you know, I say to my neighbor, hey, that's my TV. He says, no, it's not. And I said, well, then prove it. You know, get, show me the receipt if you said you bought it three months ago. He said, I don't have it. I said, well, what store did you buy it from? I'll go ask them if it's in their record. And he said, no, I paid cash from some guy in the street. Sorry. Right? He's just making up you know, he, all these convenient excuses. And then I can say, all right. And I'm telling all my neighbors, this guy stole my TV. And they're like, oh, really? And so I challenge him. And I said, look, at here and I come up with a list of a bunch of reputable arbitrators who specialize in you know, burglary and so forth and say, here you go. Here's a list of 20 people within 15 minutes of driving. I'm willing to take our case to any one of them, and then I will agree with whatever that, that arbitrator decides, because I think I have a strong case against you. And then, you know, maybe I have a security camera, and, and so maybe I have a bunch of circumstantial evidence. Maybe I'm saying, just let's look at the serial number on your TV, because I have the receipt from when I bought it, and I'm telling you that's my TV, but he won't let me in his house to look at the serial number. All right, so I do that, and then if he just says, no, I, I don't. These these arbitrators are all a bunch of uh, uh, scoundrels. Let's use my brother-in-law. He's he's fair, right? <laughs> Take it or leave it. If he does, you know, if he's acting like that, the, my neighbors are going to start to say, okay, Bob is in the right. This guy stole his TV, and maybe you know. And so I'll say, well, since you're being r ridiculous, I'm going to go to one of these professional arbitrators who hears 30 cases like this a week, and you know, there's never been an issue of them taking bribes or anything and they've given rulings and they always explain why they ruled the way they did you know in the ruling and it's you know no other legal theorist or scholar has ever thought these people did anything outrageous you know their colleagues think oh these, these are guys are, are and women are good judges so I'm gonna just pick one of them since you're not being helpful here and I'm gonna take my case and we're gonna try it. and if you don't show up tough for you and then that judge may decide that okay so the guy doesn't do that and so I take it to some judge reputable judge and I, you know I'll probably take it to somebody who's got a reputation for being really hard on, on criminals. And so then the judge makes the ruling, and he says, yep, <laughs> I agree. This guy stole your TV. Okay, so now I go back to the, the enforcement agency, you know, the, the, the company that hires a bunch of goons to come in, and I show him that, oh, Judge Hoppe has ruled in, in favor of this. Like, I show him, the, and, and, you know, there's... I've given notice to the other guy saying there's now this pending ruling where a judge agrees you took my TV. Do you want to dispute that? And he says, no, that guy hop is crazy, blah, blah, blah. All right. So at that point now, I go to that security agency and say, look, I don't want to go into this guy's house by myself. I need, you know, you call him the big guns. And they say, okay, sure. And then he comes in. <laughs> All right. 
and he comes and gets the TV. All right, so you, you get the point, though, that what I'm getting at here is that you, I think you need to disentangle the issue of who dis, how is it decided that there it has been a crime or not, and then once that's an issue and there's no doubt, so the community's not going to think that, that Guido is, is a criminal. They're not going to look at him going into a house and put, coming out with a TV and saying, oh, my gosh, he's a criminal, because for one thing, he's going to be doing it in broad daylight, He's going to have a big van with his number, you know, call us if, if some looter takes your stuff, you know. We hate looters. And, <laughs> and, and, he's, going to, and he's going to be very professional. Like I said, he's going to have a lot of body armor and stuff like, well, he doesn't need it, but you know the point. So, <laughs> and he's not, and the, and the crucial thing is he's not going to kill the guy. He's probably not even going to hurt him. Like, long, you know, he may, they may incapacitate him, like, put a, a net on him or some of those you know, those, those things, and they... <laughs> so, you, you get the point. Because it would be bad for business. You, you know, you might say, well, no, they have the right to do it. Like, if they go in there and that guy uh, comes in with a kitchen knife, they can shoot him in the head. You, you, yeah, maybe morally you think they have the right to do it, but that would be bad for business. No one's going to want to hire them again, because that's just a nightmare. It's a bad, you know, to say, oh, some guy took my TV, I hired some guys to get it back, and the, and the guy ended up dead. You know, that's in, in his own house. That doesn't sound good, right? So... <laughs> It'd be much better if they go in and you know incapacitate the you know whether like maybe they they knock out a window and shoot in tear gas and make the guy leave the house first and and they of course would have checked before to make sure there's not like an infant sleeping or something you know the point is they would be much more careful because there's competition because they kept doing stuff like that and you know oh we got to get tough on these criminals and, and Guido feared for his life no well okay maybe he would be exonerated but he wouldn't get any more business all right so that so that's the idea that the stuff we associate with police brutality now and you see these. It is, it is just shocking. I don't know if you guys look at this stuff, but no matter how much a police officer overreacts to something, like whether it's a 13-year-old in a school who mouths off and he like just beats the heck out of the kid and tackles him and breaks his nose, people always say in the comments of those news articles stuff like, well, you know, these police are putting their lives on the line every day. And you know, I mean, it, it, they could do anything, literally anything, and there would be people who just rush to their defense. So my point is, that happens because it's a monopoly. People think they have to choose between having law enforcement or not. And then, well, if we have to have it, then, yeah, sometimes people, they overreact and whatever, but that's just the cost of living in a society of laws. And no, it's not. That's the cost of living in a society with one group that has a monopoly on law enforcement. Okay, uh, let me just take a minute talking about this interesting question. Would there be prisons in a free society? Uh, yes, there would... Oh, right. I was wondering what you guys are laughing at. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. This will make sense in a minute. So, the, let me, I think thus far everything I've said, most of the anarcho-capitalists would, would agree with that, with this stuff. Here, this is my own particular idiosyncratic take, so I just want you to be aware of that, that you, you can be an anarchist and disagree or, or have different views of things. Um, the, the way I picture law enforcement working in a modern, westernized, capitalistic society is that for most people, especially the wealthier they were, if they live in a, like a suburban community where people kind of know each other especially, I think one of the, one of the ways that you would uh, supplement just the stuff I talked about before, about just randomly interacting with people and then taking your disputes to a, to a judge, I think that would all be supplemented by people sort of unilaterally making pledges to the community at large, saying, if I agree, you know, I, I agree that if I'm convicted of any of these types of offenses, I will pay out such and such uh, in terms of, of, of monetary penalties. And then I ha I'm a member of this larger group with financial resources, so you know I'm good for it. And at first, that might sound odd to you, but that's what we do with, with driving right now, and that's what surgeons do. Right? So when, you're, when you drive around right now, uh, if, you, if you're insured, you, you, know, you get into a car accident, if you're at fault, okay, you owe the other person, let's say you owe them $500,000. Like if you, know, if you kill somebody, you can say, well, gee, I don't have $500,000, but you, you're insured. And so that, oh, your insurance company pays them, even though you, know, you were at fault, you could say the insurance company, they didn't do it, but that's the point. You pay premiums to them, partly not only because your car might get totaled and you need to get it fixed, but also if you cause an accident and are at fault, you're not going to have the money to pay that huge settlement. The same thing a surgeon, if the surgeon screws up and kills somebody on the operating table, and, they, and especially if it's concluded that they, they did something really bad, it wasn't just, you know, that it was, a, it was a tough operation, but no, they botched it, 
and are legally responsible for killing that person, you say, oh, I owe the, the estate a million dollars. Well, the surgeon might not have it, but that's what they have malpractice insurance for. Okay, so by this, I'm saying take, take that logic and extend it. I'm saying I think it's possible that in a society, at least a certain type of society, you might see things like that where uh, I apply for a job somewhere and they say, well, what, what association are you a part of? And then if I tell them that they could trust it, they say, okay, because what's happening is this group that I'm a part of vouches for me. And they say, let's, you know, you hire him, and then one day you show up to work and all your uh, inventory has been cleaned out and, and Bob's in Mexico drinking tequila shots with all your stuff. Well, then we will pay you for it because we had been vouching for him. And so, yet yeah, we'll do that. And then maybe we'll go try to go get, go get Bob and recover the stuff. But that company's made whole right away by the, the association of which I was a part. So why do they do that? Because I pay them dues or premiums or whatever you want to call it. And of course, they're only going to let me in if they look at my history and see that, okay, you know, I, don't, I don't have a violent history or you know, such and such. Just like a life insurance company is going to charge different premiums to people or some people they're not going to insure at all if they have a brain tumor and things like that. Whereas if they're a smoker, they'll charge a higher premium but still give them a policy. But if they are, you know, have a brain tumor and skydive every Tuesday, they might say, we're not giving you a policy at all because that's just so risky. So the same token here, I think you would see that kind of mechanism play out to supplement the stuff I, I was talking about earlier. So now, just keep that logic going through. So let's say the really crazy cases, like some guy, uh, you know, I don't know, ax murder or something like that. And then they catch the guy, you know, they, they capture him, he's still alive. They take him to the judge's rule and say, yeah, this guy, he killed 16 people with an ax. That's kind of unusual. What do you have to say for yourself? And you know, he explains and says, well, so, so what do we do with this person? And I'm saying I think there would be a role for companies that would offer uh, things, places, buildings where people like that, that could not just be out in the community because no association would vouch for that person. No one's going to say, sure. I promise that if this person does something criminal, we'll, we'll pay you for it because they said, this guy just killed 16 people with an ax. This guy's crazy. We're not going to, we can't do that. So what do you do? Well, a company might say, hey, we will vouch for him, but only if we, you know, take him into our possession and he stays in this building and we have, you know, cameras and things like that and we can keep him here. And that person, you'd say, well, why would the per the point is the person would agree to it though, because you could explain to them. No, you're not going to be able to walk around freely because the, 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 private, the owners of the private roads and the malls and the people who have businesses, they're not going to let you onto their property. That you're a pariah right now. You have this outstanding settlement against you. You killed these 16 people and the judge has ruled that you owe their estates a million dollars a piece, something like that. So what are you going to do? The point is the person you know, could you say, come into this area and then you can work from here. You know, maybe the person is a, a brilliant engineer or something they, he can't just be out free, but maybe having a controlled environment doing that. So the, um, the reason I'm saying it's like a hotel is these things would be competing for each other. If there, if there is a market for that, if there are some criminals that are just really uh, antisocial enough that they just can't be out, I think the, the humane market solution might be that, that companies would build these things. And the reason I'm depicting it as a hotel is that they would try to attract them because the point is the, the landowners would say, get off my property. So they, they, would have, you know, they wouldn't be able to stand anywhere. They would end up in the ocean and drown, except these people say, you can come onto our property if you abide by these rules. You know, we're going to search you, of course, before you get here, make sure you don't have any shivs on you or anything like that. We're going to you know, maybe shave your head and you've got to do all these things, wear this jumpsuit and whatever, and, and submit the, what you think are humiliating uh, procedures. But those are the rules if you want to come here. But other than that, it's not going to be that they're going to, I'm not, I mean, the stuff that happens in prison right now, none of that would happen because people would just choose a different prison, right? So they would be, they would, yes, you would be in there and you would be unfree to leave, but the point is the guards wouldn't be sadistic and you wouldn't be doing crazy things like making license plates and you also wouldn't be probably, uh, you know, getting into talking to other criminals and then learning how to do stuff and then getting out later and then committing worse crimes, which is what happens right now in the criminal justice system. All right, so I am calling it a hotel, but of course, the, the people that are vouching for you, so there, there's a group saying, okay, yeah, we'll vouch for this person, but you know, you say, then say, but you got to come in here. They're going to want to make sure the person doesn't get out. So it, it's going to be an odd sort of hotel. It's going to be like the Hotel California when you get in there, okay? So 
but, but my, the point is that you see, like it's, it's inefficient like to, to execute somebody from a purely utilitarian, pragmatic sense. If the person, it could be productive and could be rehabilitated, then that's kind of a waste. And so I think in a, in a market society, a free society over time, even if it's true that the, the victim's families had the legal right to kill the person, I think the person might be able to, to buy, that, buy that off of them. You know, to, to, like there could be mutually voluntary arrangements or uh, agreements where the person says, yeah, you, you have the right to, to kill me right now because I, you know, I killed your, your father or something and you're the legal, legal heir of his estate. You have the, the moral right to kill me because I did that. But how about I go to this thing and work 20 years? You know, let's say the guy is six, fit, let's say he's 50. I'm probably going to live another 50 years. What if I go here and I and I give you 80% of my income? Well, how do you feel about that? And then the, the, you know, I think over time that would become the socially acceptable response. So yes, you could say no. I want this person dead if you wanted to. That would be your legal right. But I think over time, more and more people would view that as sort of sadistic and, you know, that's not going to bring your dad back. Why don't you just let bygones be gone? And I think in that sort of society, you would see less crime in the long run because, you know, I don't want to sound cliched, but the cycle of violence would be minimized. That would be teaching, you know, kids would see in our very civilized society, even when someone goes crazy and kills people with an axe, what do we do? Well, we contain him so he can't hurt anybody else. And there wouldn't ever be prison breaks from these things because these would be, you know, th these people would be on the line if someone escaped. It's not like the politicians who really don't suffer if someone breaks out of a prison that's in their jurisdiction. And then so we contain them, and then they're productive, and may they probably would be rehabilitated, or there would be a much better chance of rehabilitating the people there, um, especially if it was just, you know, they were on drugs or something. If there was some issue going on when they did all that stuff, there's a much better chance that they would be rehabilitated through that process legitimately. And then even there, when you talk about parole, how would parole work? Well, the, if, they just, if people run that association said, okay, we actually think this person's reformed, you know, he's expressed genuine contrition or whatever, they might then say, okay, we'll let him go out. We are the association vouching for him, and they would charge much higher premiums, and they're on the, they're on the hook. If he does go back and, and go back to his criminal past then, or criminal ways, then they're paying for it. So there would be the possibility of parole, I, I think, you know, think through the logic of what would get you in prison in the first place, how would you get out, is when people thought, yeah, I'm willing to vouch for you so you can go up, get back among society. But again, the, the incentives would be there for them to make the right decision, whereas now the people on the prison parole boards who make decisions, if they're wrong and the person goes out and kills somebody, that doesn't mean they lose $100,000 next year. Right? It just means you know, they might feel bad. But the point is here, if you screw up and vouch for someone who actually goes back falls into recidivism, then you're, you financially lose, or your company does. All right, well, let's start talking about the real fun stuff, about blowing things up. What, um, how would what we think of as military defense, how would that work? Well, most, um, I think most anarcho-capitalists think that insurance companies would pay a ma play a major role in this area. So let me just give you the, quick, the basics of it. So I don't know if you can see that, but that's supposed to be the prudential is my laser pointer oh, there it is. over there? Um, so the idea is, let's say you got a big city, and their owners, the people who own the big buildings, the skyscrapers, and so they take out insurance for things like, what if there's a fire? So they take out fire insurance. What if there's, you know, other sorts of uh, disasters that can strike? They might have various ins types of insurance policies, and then you say, well, what if? Uh, oh, a bombers fly overhead and drop bombs and blow up our skyscraper. That would kind of be a pain. And so you say, well, what, how do we, just like a, a fire would be devastating, that would be devastating if uh, foreign bombers took out our, our skyscraper our, and ruined our property. So they could go to Prudential and take out large policies against that, saying in the case that our property is damaged because of foreign military action, you, know, you indemnify us. So now, Prudential has, if you know the economics lingo, has internalized the externalities there. If they, if they have policies from a large group of clients in the same region, now dollar for dollar, Prudential is suffering the loss from anything that happens to any of their clients. So it's now in Prudential's interest. They could say, well, what if we, so they might be on the hook potentially, let's say for a billion dollars. Like if some foreign army comes up or air force comes in and just starts carpet bombing our city, we're going to be out a billion dollars. 
and then you could run the numbers like what's the what's the chance of that happening and well you know that they're not too hostile or they're this hostile and they're they're foreign that the leaders are making really aggressive speeches saying that we stole their land or whatever and it looks like they're trying to drum up their own population in a pretext to to invade this isn't good we're just sitting ducks right here so what could they do they say well we're on the hook for a billion dollars if we just spent a few hundred million we could really make it hard for them to do that you know we could buy surface to air missiles we could buy our own uh you know enemy fighters or uh aircraft fighters we could get radar installations we could maybe get naval vessels that were putting out mines in case they're trying to send their their navy in and so forth so the point is if you ran the numbers they would be the ones who would actually be funding the purchase of military hardware and they would be doing it in a competitive market it wouldn't just be you know if they could do it more cheaply they would get to pocket the difference is the point. Now, I don't think you would see huge standing armies, and they certainly wouldn't have swastikas, right? Just because that's bad for business. But especially if, it, if it's the Guido Holzman agency, that's just that, you know, his, his marketing people would say, no. <laughs> Right, so, and why wouldn't they have that? Is it just because I want to say, well, I don't, you know, we want to make sure we don't end up like the Nazi. No, because that, just think of how ridiculously expensive that would be to have that huge of a workforce. It would be much more efficient and cost effective, I think, to have a smaller group of professionals who were supplemented with extraordinary capital goods and you know, tools and equipment, and that was the way they would repel the hordes of incoming invaders if that's what a state was going to throw against them. All right, now, on this point, let me just go off on a, a little bit of a tangent. When, as an economist, I really think... The, the way warfare is treated in the popular imagination, even like in things where we're supposed to be rooting for these guys, it's just crazy. Like a few years ago, it was really rampant where there were all these Hollywood blockbusters showing, you know, the, the movie would be building up, and then at the end, there would be these grand epic battles where you'd have thousands of people on this side and thousands of people on this side, and then they just go, oh, and they run at each other. And I'm just thinking the best you can do with the thousands of incredibly productive people on your side, those resources that are like computers and very creative things, is to say, let's all just sprint into a wall of swords. That's crazy. That is just the stupidest thing imaginable, right? In terms of, if you, especially like in the, the, uh, like the, the Civil War, the war between the states, the war of northern aggression, whatever you want to call it, there, I mean, on paper, the, the southern states should have easily been able to survive. They should have easily fended off the invasion from the north. And if you wanted to, so what, well, how did they lose? Well, look what they did. They went around and like basically at gunpoint, rounded up all their able-bodied men and then said, okay, you see these cannons? Let's go. <laughs> like if you were a spy sent by Lincoln to destroy the fighting power of the Confederacy, what better thing could you do than to say, okay, we could just like do guerrilla warfare. We could just like take pot shots at their commanding officers, then run away like we did in the Revolutionary War against the British or we could all get into a single file line, put on nice bright colors to make sure they know who we are, and then march at them and you know, maybe yell stuff at them, and maybe that'll work. I mean, that's crazy, just marching into their guns. That's crazy, when, when they're clearly more, uh, better equipped than we are. All right, so the point is that the conventional warfare, the type of warfare in which states engage, that's crazy, and I don't think in a free society you would see us copying their methods, only it would be private. I think we would do things completely differently it would be it would be like um, I think the the Vietnam War, except the technological roles would be reversed, right? So you'd have the invading state would would, would have all, you know all these big bombs and have all kinds of troops and stuff, whereas the resistance would be guerrilla warfare doing all these sorts of uh, decentralized things that was hard to fight. Except the the anarchist society would other things equal be a lot more technologically advanced, and so I, I think. When you see uh, government, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to have a slide at the end about this stuff. Okay, uh, whoops, I skipped one point here. Uh, down here, what about public goods? I just want to mention, when you bring this stuff up to academic economists, they think they have a trump card. They say, no, no, military defense is the epitome of a public good. It can't be provided in the private sector. Right? By a public good, they mean that you know, once you provide it, you can't exclude others from being able to use it. And also, one person's enjoyment of it doesn't detract from somebody else's enjoyment of it. So if you, uh, you, know, you build this SAM site here, and that deters the enemy from coming in because they know, oh, we're going to lose a lot of our fighter pilots and, and the, our pilots for the bombers, and so we don't, it's not worth us going in there. 
well, what, what if people, people could decide, well, we're not going to pay a prudential. You know, we're not going to be part of their, their company anymore because we're just going to sit back and enjoy this public good. So th that is an issue, but in practice, I think that it's over, overblown, that it's not, that military defense actually is a lot more of a private good than people normally think of. So especially for things like um, pr protecting shipping, like if you're trying to ship merchandise across the ocean and you need to have a convoy of military vessels to provide an escort, clearly, if the people in the convoy aren't paying for it, you can just not protect them, right? So you can clearly exclude service there. Now, yeah, if you're going to have something like ICBMs and that's how you're going to deter a Soviet invasion, that it's kind of hard to restrict it to the paying customers versus the, you, you can't protect this half of the city from getting nuked and not protect that half. You know, if you're going to protect the city from an incoming nuclear bomb, everyone's protected. That is true. But a lot of stuff in military defense isn't quite like that. Um, another example, if you have enemy troops marching, then clearly the people on the border of your region have to be paying customers. Otherwise, you would just pull back your own forces you know, further and, and let those outliers just get eaten up by the, the incoming hordes, right? So the point is, yeah, there is some slipperiness, and it's a, a public good in some respects, but it's not, if you actually think through the logic of it, it's not really as clear-cut as a standard economics textbook would have you believe. Okay. Wouldn't warlords take over? Now, I have a Mises.org article with that title. So if you are interested in this, I would recommend that you, re you read this. If you just Google Robert Murphy, wouldn't warlords take over? This will, it'll be one of the top hits. Walter Block has told me, I don't remember his exact words, but something like, this is one of the single best pieces on uh, private military defense he's ever read. And I kind of have to agree with him. It's really... Uh, <laughs> You remember the scene from A Christmas Story when little Ralph, he's reading his essay over, he's like, oh, wow, that's great. That's kind of how I felt reading this. <laughs> so what, what, let me just very quickly, what are the points here? This, what you need to do is compare apples to apples, right? So yes, it is, it is possible, and we have, we've seen historically, there can be regions where there's no state and a libertarian utopia doesn't emerge next Tuesday, right? That, that's clear. That happens. So no one's making the claim that any time you have the absence of a state, all these market forces are going to kick in and everyone's just going to have these voluntary, peaceful uh, society just pop out. But the point is, usually, where, where we see this happen is a region that used to have a government that descended into civil war. And that's why it's the mess it is now. So it's not that the people had a government and then they were all reading Rothbard and said, oh my gosh. And then their, and their government just dissolved away. That's not what happened. They were all still statists, and they started trying to kill each other because they wanted to seize control of the government, and then no one group was strong enough, and the government fell, and now they're all fighting each other. Okay, so that is hardly uh, an argument against anarcho-capitalism, and moreover, you could just easily cite that and say, well, that's why you can't have a government or a state, because look, at sometimes it descends into civil war, right? So it's, it's interesting that these, case, these alleged case studies in, in Rothbardism are actually cases of failed states. So it's, you, again, you, you just say, well, that's what happens when you try to set up a government. If, if people, if the balance of power shifts, it might dev devolve into civil war. So what the, the claim is, is that take any group of people, whatever their level of peacefulness and their ability to put a to compromise and to not use violence and so forth to settle disputes, and we're saying uh, it's less likely that there's going to be warfare if you disperse the power, that you're more likely to see uh, aggression and so forth if you give one group all the guns or most of the guns and the authority to tell everyone else what to do and then there's this ideological background where everyone else thinks yet yeah, these people are in charge and they can take as much of our money as they want and they have a monopoly on these things that that, that actually is, is a recipe for disaster and so again it's not it doesn't matter what your view of human nature is whether you think people are angels or whether you think they're devils the point is having a, a group given, given a monopoly of the legitimate use of violence that seems like a very dangerous thing in, in either case. So just to tr follow this train of thought a little bit more, what happens is that people will say, to make the case for a, a limited government, excuse me, they'll say, well, if you got a group of people in a state of anarchy and they're all patronizing different competing judicial agencies or defense agencies, and, and people have different views initially. Like some people believe in capital punishment, some people don't, some people think abortion's murder, some people don't think it is. 
some people, you know, think that if you violate certain religious laws, you should get your hand chopped off. Other people think that's crazy. So you've got all these people in a pressure cooker, and if you just had anarchy, the way you guys are talking about, they would just be duking it out, and, you know, and perhaps as a matter of prudence, you're right, maybe the, the agencies wouldn't necessarily be shooting each other all the time, but there would just be, there would be no rule of law. It would just be real hostile, and it would just be groups always at each other's throats and maybe just not attacking out of prudence, but that's not the kind of world I want to live in. Instead, let's form a government where we all agree, yet we have these different viewpoints of what the just society looks like, but let's have periodic elections, and we all agree we're, we're not going to contest it. You know, as long as it's a fair election, we all abide by the rules, we're going to elect a government to implement these views, to try to build a consensus. And if people don't like it, they can elect somebody else the next cycle. Okay? So, but we're, we're going to not use violence to settle these disputes, and that's the role, that's why we have a limited state, and that's the argument. So what I'm going to say is, if you have a society that's capable of doing that, and, and for one thing, that's no state ever actually emerged in that nice, peaceful, voluntary fashion, but if it did, I'm saying that population that's so virtuous enough to be able to do that, why, when they're in a state of anarcho-capitalism, why would they be top patronizing defense agencies that were shooting each other up? If you're willing to say, yeah, I realize I have fundamentally different views from you, you think abortion is fine, I think it's murder, but let's, you know, I'm not going to physically attack you, let's vote and try to settle at the ballot box. If you're that reasonable of a person, why then wouldn't you also say, okay, I see we have legitimate differences, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to pay money to a, a private security agency that goes and, and tackles you when you go into an abortion clinic because I recognize that you, li you know, you, even though I think you're wrong, I understand you don't think that that's murder, and so I'm not going to patronize a defense agency that's just going to just be real provocative, and I can see that that's not good in the long run if we're having our agencies fight each other over this issue. Okay, so the point is, you can say, oh, that's not realistic, but then why can we settle at the ballot box? So my point is just a society that can compromise and settle things peacefully, even though there's legitimate and serious disagreement on really important issues, through the ballot box, why couldn't they do that much more effectively through the market where there's not all the other problems that go along with uh, government democracy? Okay, then the last objection I'll entertain and I'll answer a few of your questions. Wouldn't a neighboring state invade? So I've already given a little bit of my answer here, so let me just mention a few points. One thing is, uh, I think a, a crucial point, people say, oh man, the, the government would have so many advantages, a neighboring state would have so many advantages that the free society wouldn't. They could engage in a, a draft, you know, they could conscript a lot of people so they could throw a lot more manpower at us. They, uh, they can tax their own people and raise a lot more revenue than the insurance companies could do in the, in the private analog, you know, the, the, the next door society that, that's relying on purely voluntary means. And so even though it's not fair, it's undeniable that yet yeah, that neighboring state, if it wanted to, could just steamroll over us because they could just throw so many more resources at us. So there's a couple things. One is other things equal, the anarchist society that's a free society of the kind we're envisioning is going to be phenomenally wealthy. So even if it's true that they can only devote 1% of their output to military defense, whereas the neighboring state devotes 50% of their output to defense, even on its own terms, that it doesn't follow, therefore, that the defender is going, to be, is going to be at a loss because they're going to be so much richer. The other thing is governments notoriously don't spend their military funds wisely. So it's the amount that like the Pentagon spends to get fighter aircraft, I don't think a truly anarchist society that is buying uh, planes to defend itself, military jets to defend itself, is going to spend the same amount just because they're going to be more careful with their money. So the, the point is the Pentagon overspends because it's a corrupt process where they're basically funneling, shoveling money to their buddies, and then they know when they leave the Pentagon they're going to get nice plush uh, consulting contracts and things like that. So it's a big game as a way for them to take taxpayer money without literally just pocketing it when they're in office or when they're you know, in the military. So you, you have that issue too, that don't be afraid of these big numbers, that it's, um, it's not apples to apples. The other thing, and that's what the, the point of having a porcupine here, is that right now you think, oh man, look at how much the U.S. government spends on its military, but the U.S. government is trying to run the world. Right? They need to have aircraft carriers to be able to project force. You know, that's what the History Channel always talks about. The U.S. military's ability to project force. And it's, you know, yeah, project that force. Um, 
so the, the point is that the, the anarchists said wouldn't need to do that. They would just have to make it really inconvenient for someone to invade them, right? They don't need to be able to project force around the globe. They don't need to be able to bomb and take out some, some city 10,000 miles away. They don't have to have the ability. They just have to, so they don't need to have long range bombers. They don't need to have things. They don't need to have submarines that can go around the world and can stay out at sea for six months at a time before you know, going to port and getting more food and all that kind of stuff. They just need to have submarines that can go out a little bit and try to shoot the, the enemy submarines that are trying to infiltrate their waters or that can lay mines or whatever. Right? So my point is that they could, for a lot less money, they could repel a military that on paper was a lot more expensive and, and do a good job of it. All right, so why don't I stop there and I'll turn it over to your, I'm sure, interesting thought experiments. Yeah. Will this ever happen? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it could. So we can always dream. Yeah. Did you like that answer? <laughs> mm hmm. Right. Okay, so the question, in case you didn't hear it, was Hoppe, has, following Mises, you know, has, has talked about the difference between events that are insurable and those that really aren't, and it's abusive language to say that we insured against this thing. Uh, and so he's asking, you know, is it really true that insurance companies could provide these types of services? So, so here, and you're, I'm glad you brought that up. So this, again, let me just stress there is a difference in treatment here. I think just about everybody who subscribes to the Rothbardian view thinks that insurance companies would uh, in, like, insure law-abiding people, and then if somebody aggresses against them, would then try to go get, you know, pay them off, and then try to go get the bad guy. So like the stuff I was talking about, Prudential, insuring the owners of skyscrapers, and then saying, well, we know if bombers come in and take it out, we have to pay them, so we're going to spend money to try to prevent that damage in the first place. I think everybody is on board with that because that's, uh, I mean, that, that, that's, uh, looks like you can have insurance against vandalism or so if someone comes and breaks into your house and steals things, I mean, you can be insured against that. And that's an example of human action doing this. So that would be the answer. The, now, the thing where there is controversy is me saying, what if you're, in a sense, insuring yourself against being the criminal? And there are a lot of people say, wait a minute, that's, that's kind of weird. You can't, you know, because you have control over whether you're a criminal or not. And so some people don't like that, me taking it that way. But most people agree you can insure against bad people doing stuff to you because that is a quantifiable thing. So I'm not, I understand what you're saying. If you want to say it isn't, that's fine. But they would just say, well, there's plenty of things right now where insurance companies insure you against stuff that ultimately other people are controlling. It's just not the policyholder isn't controlling it. Okay, maybe one more. Yep. Okay, so the question is, would I advocate, is that the verb, would I advocate the execution of a criminal who is unwilling to work and doesn't, and hasn't, wasn't insured, and just like, so he does something and the judge says, okay, you owe the estate a million dollars, he doesn't have it, and he doesn't want to work, and then the family, okay. Well, when you say, would I advocate it, no, I personally would not because I'm a pacifist, all right? But if you're saying, as an economist, would I predict, would that be the status of the law? Yeah, I think it would be, elite, like, with people's conceptions of justice right now, I do predict if the world went anarcho-capitalist tomorrow, at least, you know, among uh, Western societies, that, yeah, I think people would say you have, if somebody kills somebody in your family, you have the right to kill them if you want. And I do think some people would, uh, would agree. I think some people wouldn't. You know, some people would just say, no, let's just move on, and that's, that's just going to make it worse if we try to take revenge. But I think plenty of people would, and I do predict that that would be legal. Well, okay, the question was, would the man just walk free if, it, it could be a woman, let's not be sexist. <laughs> and ladies, if you want to murder someone, then, you know, girl power. Um, the, <laughs> so the question is, would the person just walk free, and this is, a, this is the last point, and I'll let you guys go to dinner here, but this is a good segue, and I think an important point, that's one of the neat things about having a private property society even if there is a crazy judicial ruling and everyone's like, oh my gosh, a murderer just walked because let's say there's some technicality, the way the contracts were written 
somebody actually gets off with what everyone knows was, was a, a crime or because the, the, uh, he committed it against like, some Amish people or something and they just said, no, we forgive you, we're not going to press charges. So everyone knows that's a murderer walking around. The people who own the private roads could say, all right, well, you can't walk on my road. And the people who own the grocery stores, well, you can't shop here. And so the person would still be a pariah and you know, would be shunted to the outskirts of society, even though technically we wouldn't have the legal ability to grab him. I mean, he could, and, you know, if he owned his house and he might live in his house and maybe the, the electricity company would still do business with him. But the point is, he, he would have his freedom restricted in, in the, the everyday sense of that term, even though technically he wasn't convicted of that crime. So, so that's, that's the issue. All right, thanks everybody.